Hello everyone. Uh, apologies for the slightly late start. Um, YouTube live is not as convenient as Twitch. Um, so, you know, um, still we persevere. Um, all right. So today we're doing the second of four, um, code demos. These are the live coding sessions in which I walk you through a Jupyter notebook that we've created to accompany the webinars that we gave back in June, I believe. You can see those webinars uh, on our UK data service channel. So the, the recorded videos of those webinars are available. And um, we have one code demo. There are sorry, two code demos per for the first of those recorded webinars. And then there's one code demo for the second and third webinar. So I'll stop gabbing. Uh, let me just check. Can everyone hear me? Type that into the um, chat as well. And hopefully this. All right. We've got at least one confirmation that you can hear me. That is great. Um, just to let you know, Dermot McDonald is also in the chat. Hopefully I have enabled him as a moderator on the chat so he can share the link um, if you need it to get to the code. Otherwise, you can follow the um, GitHub link we have here. These are the four code demos. The first one, processing, is what I covered last week today, extraction. And then uh, next we'll do classifiers and finally ending a month on social networks. Um, but right, let's get right to it. So last week, oh, sorry, two weeks ago, um, the first code demo that we did covered basic text mining sort of processing functions, things like correcting the spelling, removing uh, numbers, uh, removing the punctuation, substituting regular expressions so that, you know, abbreviations and the full versions of, of country names would be, you know, unified. Um, this is important, especially if you're doing the bag of words method of text mining, because you want all of the different instances of the same word to be counted as the same. And that means sort of forcing them into looking the same as far as the sort of word counts and, and sort of natural language processing is concerned. Now, at the very end of the last coding session, we um, ran into the issue of stemming and lemmatizing. They are both ways of turning words into the different versions of the word, like plurals or, um, you know, different verb forms of, of the same verb into the same word. Stemming is a very basic way of doing it. It sort of lops off everything at the end of a word that is typical of plurals or verb endings, and you can end up with really truncated sometimes incorrect verb stems. Lemmatizing is more sophisticated. It turns uh, words into their root, which is um, a little bit more, um, a little bit more sophisticated. So for example, it'll turn the verbs into the verb root and the nouns into the noun root and the adjectives into the adjectival root and things like that. So it's, it's, it pays attention to the part of speech if you give it that. Otherwise it will just be a little bit more sophisticated than cutting off S's to reduce plurals and things. So to start out, we're going to finish up some processing so that we can properly lemmatize things. And to do that, we need to start off with importing some of the functions that we need. Um, and this is actually all of this stuff is something we covered in the last one. But basically, I need to get us back to the point we were at the end of the last session uh, so we can move on. So I'm going to just run this whole block by clicking, double clicking in the code block and hitting Control Enter. Yeah, I'm sorry, Shift Enter. Um, and then we're going to go on to part of speech tagging. And last time we passed it through the limitizer, but it treated everything as nouns because we hadn't part of speech tagged our uh, 
corpus. So now we're going to part of speech tag it and put it back through the lemmatizer and we'll see what a difference that makes. All right, I see that Dermot has given the link to everyone um, and that we've got 20 viewers. Good, and that you can all hear. This is going remarkably well so far, um, despite the hiccup and the late start. Apologies again for that. So, um, so it's telling me, great, everything's up to date, all of this. The code block has finished running because we can see that it's a number rather than an asterisk. So I'm going on to the next code block. So this is where we were last time, basically, with a tokenized corpus. And this is, um, so sample corpus spelling errors numbers. Okay, good. So um, there's no punctuation. There's no lower uh, uppercase letters in this. It's got spell checked. It's got the stop words removed. That's quite handy. Um, so now we're going to just have a look at the, you know what, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, um, I've actually already run this code, but when you print the corpus that is position tagged, so you're going to pass corpus with no space, that's the output of this one, to our NLTK position tagger to create corpus position tagged. Now we're gonna have a look at the first hundred. So, I mean, this has already been run, but that's all right, I'll run it again. And this time we see our words. So sample here, corpus spelling is now sample noun, and that's NN means noun. Corpus, again, NN for noun spelling verb gerund, I believe is what the G means there, errors. This time we have NNS and that stands for noun plural and so on as it goes through. So, you know, we get verb, here's verb with a Z, here's um, JJ, I believe that's an adjective. Um, you know, we get all kinds of things here. So, uh, so now that we have each of the words is as part of speech tagged. We can pass it back through our lemmatizer and this time we will get more accurate lemmatized versions. So this time we again define our, um, we define a function which takes a tag. So it, it takes, unfortunately, the problem with this lemmatizer is that despite both the lemmatizer and the part of speech tagger coming from NLTK that don't use the same vocabulary for um, the parts of speech. And that why that should be is beyond me. Really, someone ought to be um, sort of correcting that uh, as, as, a, as a function. But in the meantime, I, got, I found this on um, sort of a a forum and it seems to work fairly well. So what this does is it takes, it's just a little function that takes our part of speech tagged words, translates it into the right part of speech formatting and gives it back to the lemmatizer. So then I create a blank corpus lemmatized and for the pair of items in our corpus part of speech tagged, we append you know, that we give the limitizer the pair and then we say, tell it, you know, use this part of that pair for the word itself and that part of the pair for its part of speech and then append it to our empty corpus. So let's run this. Okay. So this time, and we only get the um, part of the, the word back. We don't care about the part of speech anymore. So sample, corpus, spell. So it was spelling and now it's spell. Error. It was errors and now it's error. Number, right, to, way, example. So all of these things, very useful. Um, you know, this is, this is a more sophisticated kind of lemmatization. Now, you can, of course, keep the part of speech tag. Um, you just change this part of the code, you know, instead of asking for just to just append 
um, the first part. You can have it append the whole pair, um, but that's, you know, it depends on whether you need that part of speech tag for anything else. Now, lemmatization is a very good process because it really prepares you for uh, counting the words in your corpus accurately for doing sort of relative word counts and, and comparing different kinds of um, documents. For example, if you want to say this person uses this unusual word unexpectedly often, you know, that's that's a unique feature of, of this person's writing. We can look for that in other documents and suggest whether or not that document is authored by this person. That's one possibility. But there are lots of other things, for example, named entity recognition and chunking. So now these are NLP processes. So they really use the structure of the words and the, the structure of the sentences, the language. So before jumping ahead to the statistical counts of words, you, you might want to do more processing on the language. Um, just checking the chat. If anyone has any questions about lemmatizing or this code, now is a good time to bring those up. I realize there is a slight delay between when I'm saying you can ask questions about lemmatizing and code and when you might actually hear that and get a chance to um, to ask your questions. But just the same, you know, let me know. Um, in the meantime, um, I will point out that, um, so named what, I'll, I'll start a little bit about chunking, but I'll, I'll happily go back to lemmatizing or, or any of the code I've shown you already if you have questions. Chunking is, when we tokenize things, we broke them down into the smallest useful parts. But the smallest useful parts are not always the parts that we want to look at ultimately. So chunking is a way of building back those parts into useful chunks. So here's, here's an example. For example, if my sentence is the cat in the hat, I might want the cat to be a, a useful chunk or the cat in the hat to be a useful chunk or even in the hat, because those are sort of different structurally relevant parts of the sentence as it occurs in the original text. So the chunks here are, the whole thing is one chunk marked with this S for sentence. Each of the individual bits, so the is marked as a determiner, cat is marked as a noun phrase, and then that is in its own chunk marked as organization, which is a little bit strange, but what it means is like individual or organization or named entity. And in the hat, um, so hat is here is also a noun phrase in and the. So what you need to do is import chunk from NLTK. And then we're going to, it stands for named entity chunk. Other chunkers are available if you want sort of like a geographic focus chunk. I think there's one that really focuses on areas rather than people and organizations, but named entity is a good one to start with. So let me just run this code. And what I want it to do is take our part of speech tagged corpora. Um, so I've created a second part of speech tagged corpora um, because you, if you want a named entity recognition, it has to be before lemmatizing. You want to... Um, you want to keep the, the part of speech tags. Okay. And I'm, I've selected a particular section of this to highlight how, um, so not just the first hundred things, I've, a particular organization, I particularly wanted to highlight how UK is a noun phrase, organization, again, organization means individual or entity or organization or, or something like that. And here again, the United Kingdom, also an organization. And here, the United Kingdom of 
And here's another tree, Great Britain. And the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So all of these it recognizes as sort of structures, trees, organizations that have an internal structure within it. So you can think of it as sort of like a coat hanger, where at the top of the coat hanger is, is the chunk and all the bits of the sentence that relate to it are hanging off the bottom. So, um, let me just double check. No questions about limitizing or um, the code up above. So absolutely feel free to ask questions about part of speech tags, named entities, chunks. Ask questions at any point that you want. Um, so you might have noticed that I used corpus position tagged two here instead of corpus position part of speech tagged um, that I that I used earlier. I did not use this corpus pos tagged. I used corpus pos tagged two, and that is because corpus pos tagged two came straight from corpus words. I did not run it through the um, stop words, punctuation, all of that kind of correction. I wanted to keep the stop words, wanted to keep the punctuation. Now you might be wondering, well, why? Um, you just, you know, that's, that's pretty irritating to have all of those stop words and punctuation and, and errors and spelling errors and other things. Um, you're absolutely welcome to try see what happens when you get uh, when you use the part of speech tagged um, corpus that has all of those things removed you don't get great recognition of the entities and it turns out because the little things like the and in and of those are stop words that are unhelpful in the bag of words model for distinguishing one text from another but they are very useful in um, named entity recognition and other kinds of chunking. So that's the kind of structure that allows us and named entity recognizers and other chunkers to understand groups of words together as a single entity. But they are not good for helping us distinguish one document from another. So yeah, as I point out, there's no tree markers, there's no organization markers. And as, you, as I said, that's because these words have a role in understanding entities and objects within the structure of a sentence. They are not helpful for identifying documents. So now we get on with, at this point you have to think like, you have to start thinking a little bit critically about why you are doing the analysis that you're doing. Do you want to look at the document as a whole and therefore, maybe a bag of words model is appropriate. Remove all the stop words, all of the uh, punctuation, all of the spelling errors. Or do you want to look at it as a structured set of things? Um, you know, who are the entities within this document? Who are the, where are the places mentioned? Because maybe you want to use these documents um, to determine whether or not two different corporations are mentioned in the same news articles or whether two different you know uh, people are referenced in the same um, blog or something like that this is this means that you need to identify those things you don't really care about the whole text you're, you're caring about individual chunks of text within it so there's very different purposes for doing a natural language processing and you need to know that before you start because that will determine whether you need to do, run all of the other steps the, the stop word removal the punctuation removal etc so assuming you're doing a bag of words model where you want to identify the frequency of words used within a particular document maybe to identify the the author maybe to identify its genre maybe to identify its sort of level or mood or something like that, 
then you're going to want counts and relative frequency. You might think this is a very basic function of language, like counting how many times a word appears. But surprisingly, we can learn quite a lot from word counts, which is why counter is a, a function within NLTK. And you can um, do this and it will tell you that basically it will count down. Um, it will give you a sorted list of all of the words used in this. In this case, you do want to use a heavily processed corpus. You want stop words removed, otherwise they will, the first you know 20 things listed will be stop words. You want the punctuation removed, you want the spelling errors removed, you want you want it lem stemmed at the very least, properly lemmatized if you can. So within our corpus, because it was a few sentences I wrote and then some like uh, fine print from a uh, website, it's got 123 instances of the word information, 80 for the word site, 74 for use, 64 for may, 58 for personal, 40 for policy, etc, etc. This is obviously not thrilling text. Um, but let's, let's have another look at it. So we can look at the 100 most common because maybe we don't want to get all the way down to things that are only used once. So you know, there's some code you can do here for the 100 most common. And that takes us down to words that are used four times. And following that, let's Let's get on something that's a little bit more interesting. And that is, let's look at Jane Austen's Emma. So what we're going to do is import nltk.corpus. This is a set of texts that you can get through NLTK that you can work with. You can test on them or you can use them as standards of comparison to other kinds of documents as you like. I'm going to set a variable called Emma to be the raw version of Gutenberg um, collections version of Austin Emma, Jane, Jane Austen's Emma. Going to word to tokenize that. Going to re remove all the uppercase. Going to correct the spelling. Remove the stop words. Remove the punctuation. Remove any blank spaces left by removing the punctuation. Part of speech tag it. And lemmatize it. And then I'm going to count um, all of the words in Emma and print the count. So give this just a moment. Feel, again, feel free to send in questions. Um, realize I might be blitzing through this uh, or hanging about on concepts that you think actually got that already to just get on with it so you know let me know if the speed is too fast or too slow or too boring i don't know i mean i can try and tell you some jokes but um the last time i tried to tell jokes in a code demo uh dermot said my jokes were terrible i don't doubt that so this is taking a little while because actually this is quite a lot of processes. Um, but I ran it already and I've given you the most common uh, for corpus counts. That was my original corpus document and the most common for Emma counts. So you can see original site use may personal, etc. That was from our first one. Um, for Emma, there are a couple of punctuation issues that are clearly not addressed well by punctuation uh, removal. Mr. Say, s, so the possessive, presumably. Emma could, would, miss, must, well, Harriet, much, think, thing. So clearly these are very different. Um, but, you know, we can also, we can look at the most common in both of these documents, but we can also compare how many times a particular word was used in both documents. And I chose the word personal because I thought actually that's the kind of word that might appear in both documents. And so I ran that. I found 58 occurrences for personal. We can see that here because personal was one of the most 
um, common words used in the, my made up corpus and it occurs seven times in Emma. So that is distinctly different. Um, so the sample text is actually much, much shorter than Emma. Emma is a full book, whereas my sample text was like, I don't know, seven or eight paragraphs. So despite fast differences in length, there are a sort of an inverse re relation to the word personal suggests that it is a very meaningful difference in how these two texts use the word personal. That they're not, that it's not as if the English language typically has so many occurrences of the word personal per thousand words of text or something like that. Depending on your research questions, that could be very significant. Now, another way to compare two texts is to say how similar they are. And you could do that one by one. You know, you could create, sort all of the words in there and see how commonly they're used. Uh, or you could one by one compare, you know, the frequency of the word, of this word in text A and text B and, and another word in text A and text B. And that is possible, but very time consuming to do for all of the words in a document. So instead, I want to introduce you to the idea of similarity comparisons. And so there's a package called Spacey, which you will want. Okay, this might take a little while because the Emma one from above is still running. But what Spacey does is um, essentially it loads a, if you see down here, this stands for English core from the web large. And what that does is it's a, it's a set of vectors um, that has 300 dimensions for each vector. No, sorry, 300 dimensional vectors for each word. And if that sounds like nonsense, then I will explain it a little bit better. Um, what it means is that there's a large set of words that are common in English, each of which comes with a sort of scorecard or table or ranking. It has uh, 300 different columns in it. And that is essentially an abstract way of capturing the meaning of the word. This is not derived by logically scoring um, each word on different things. It is, let me just run this code while we're here. It is derived by sort of um, an AI sort of analysis of how words are used in lots of text. And um, it, it looks for patterns like, is, it you, is this word used more often as a noun or a verb? Is it usually plural? If it's a noun, is it usually a gerund form? If it's a verb, is it frequently preceded like adject by certain adjectives, like little or unprecedented, always or never? I mean, we can kind of think of this if we think of words like um, uh, red apple. That is a pairing that is more common than uh, purple apple, for example. Um, so, so we can see that red, the apple means redness more than it means purpleness. So that would be captured by two vectors, one for red, one for purple, and the red one would be a numerically different vector than the purple one. Um, so what we see here, this time we're comparing a set of words. So troll compared to troll, that, that is essentially it. So now you can compare um, texts as well as words. And it works a little bit like... Um, Instead of having an established scorecard of 300 dimensional vectors for each word, it creates a scorecard of dimensional vectors per text and then compares those two. So first, I'm going to set up a couple of variables. Similarity Emma, similarity person, 
uh, persuasion similarity firefox that's a, a document of things scraped off um, firefox it's just sort of a, it's a, a web document that you can get access to and the similarity for our, our original corpus my several seven or eight paragraphs of gobbledygook so i'm going to create these variables and then i'm going to print their similarity of all of these oh sorry i have similarity caesar um julius caesar i think i'm going to compare them to emma so i'm going to compare emma to persuasion both being written by jane austen i would expect them to be relatively similar i would expect emma and firefox to be very different just like emma and my gobbledygook corpus um, and it's still running because actually creating uh, the dimensional vectors for these um, objects is not trivial you know it is importing the raw text and it is putting it through this sort of similarity analysis that creates a, a scorecard of dimensional vectors for that text so this is still running because it uh, takes a bit of time to do this but actually i did this in advance and we see that austin emma and austin persuasion um, come out at 0.9986 so they are very similar which isn't really surprising they're written by the same author they're written in the same time period they're written as about you know the same kinds of people broadly in the same sort of say, facing similar sort of problems so they come out as very similar whereas emma and julius caesar comes out as less similar but still quite similar and maybe that's not surprising they're both written um they're both pieces of fiction they're both um about people in positions of power sort of trying to achieve things whereas emma and the firefox document comes out as much less similar um and this is because ultimately they are written in english so they share a lot of similarities but they are much less similar than emma and persuasion so um, let me just run this code again and see. Oh, we get a, yeah, Sim Caesar is not defined. Okay, so let's um, try it again without that. Okay, yeah. So it's not Caesar that, yeah. So Emma and Persuasion, very similar. Emma and Firefox, not so much. Emma and Corpus still quite similar so you know um and we can have a look at firefox and corpus if we wanted to see why we thought these might be different i suspect because firefox contains um chat um or sort of like comments posted on on blog articles and so it's going to have a lot of misspellings and sort of slang and web speak so you know abbreviations and things like that so these are useful if you want to compare two documents either in their use of a particular word or two documents as a whole and um, you can even compare within a document two words for how they are used so you can create your own sort of document vectors for all of the words in a document so you can say in Jane Austen's Emma, she uses gentleman substantially differently than she uses man or uses them in interchangeable ways. You could compare the similarity of two words like that and say, look, she uses these words to be, you know, they have such a high similarity that they are effectively interchangeable. Or despite logically being quite, quite similar, she uses them in very different contexts. That's perhaps something you want to argue that you could support your argument through natural language processing. Okay, so I'm running on a bit. Um, I don't see any new comments in the chat, um, but I do wanna talk a little bit about discovery. 
So discovery is how you um, sort of explore a text in terms of the structures that it has. So if you import these various uh, functions, including matcher and span and displacey, that's part of the spacey package, um, then you can look at Emma, for example, and you can pull out all of the bits of a sentence that contain a structure, including like a. Now, I've already done this, so his appearance was very neat. He looked like a sensible young man. Um, and it sort of includes a certain amount of, of text around that. Uh, terribly like a would-be lover here. Saw something like a look of spring, you know, okay, very good. Um, but let's take a closer look at the instances. So you can you can zoom in on that and sort of put the words around it in terms of, you know, their, their function, their structure, their part of speech. So his appearance was very neat, comma, and he looked like a sensible young man. We can see that here we have like is a conjunction, a is a determiner, followed by adjective, adjective, noun. Okay, very good. And when we come to the next one, let's see where like is. Like is, again, a conjunction, determiner. This one is verb followed by a verb. So that's that's substantially she's using like a in very different structural ways. And that might be interesting to you, or you might actually just want all of the, um, all the ones that are like a noun. So we've defined this as the pattern. We want uh, like a, and then any noun. So let's, if we search Emma for that, we find like a look, like a merit, like a gentleman, like a job, like a job, like a woman, a bride, a brother, a daughter. Okay, interesting. So for the most part, she's talking about people and how they look. Unless, I mean, it'd be hard to describe, you know, a sofa is looking like a brother. I don't know. She might. Um, but if we take another closer look, so here we include optional things like modifiers. Then we get things like, like a sensible young man, like a young man, like a bride, a perfect cure, a brother, a sensible man. And that's interesting. We've got sensible young man young man and sensible man. There's something kind of going on there that we might want to explore further. So we could look specifically at um, the vectors within Emma for sensible, young and man and see see whether they kind of entail each other, whether they're, they're used functionally different than young woman, whether woman is ever described as sensible or whether in fact these are quite distinct like words that are used in very different contexts. It would be a way to explore the text of Emma numerically to support or disprove arguments you had about how words are used and how meaning is developed. So we've reached the end, more or less. Um, we've really only dipped our toes into natural language processing, but I do want you at this point to understand that your research questions, what you want to discover or show or explore or, or find out or test, will shape the natural language processing that you do. So how your data, your text, your corpus, your research materials, what processes they need to go to depends on the questions you have and the steps you want to follow. Do you want to remove the punctuation? Yes, if you're doing bag of words approach. No, if you want to chunk or name dente recognition, although you can later remove the punctuation and stop words after you have the chunks identified. Okay, and, um, you know, I also want you to start thinking about the possibilities of what you can do with words. So, for example, if you if you want to examine, you know, Jason, Jane Austen's work from a, a particularly particular literary style or a theory, you know, maybe um, feminist critique or something like that, then you might want to look at these words and these structures and how they're used and how often they're used and how they're used differently in Jane Austen's work as opposed to, you know, the Bronte sisters work or 
um, a con contemporary male writer's work or something like that. So I've included some further reading here at the end, um, different books you can read, also the different packages that I've used and, and you can read up more about them. And also some recommendations for R because I understand that lots of you want to use R for text mining. And um, I will be doing a series of code demos like this, but using R rather than Python, hopefully uh, either at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Um, yeah, so I am now uh, taking questions. Um, you can ask me anything. Um, feel free. Uh, I'll be here all week. Although not live streaming all week, that would get really tedious. Um, yeah, so please. Tell me what kinds of maybe research questions you think you might want to use natural language processing for. And um, we can maybe explore whether these processes you are, are suitable for what you want to do or whether there's other processes realize of course we're still at the very very basic stages of our um, exploration in natural language processing there are two other uh, code demos coming up and um, they really only take pick two topics that people kind of suggested they might want to use natural language processing for um, Sentiment analysis, that's a popular one. Lots of people want to understand sentiment analysis. And then uh, extracting named entities to create social networks. So that's that's another one. And yes, the webinars are available for those. That's great. But, um, you know, uh, I will also be going through the Jupyter notebooks uh, that, that are created to go with those webinars and taking your questions. So if you have any, go ahead. Um, it's entirely possible that, um, you know, I'm just not, uh, my stream is being a bit slow and laggy. I understand that a couple of points, the picture cut out and I apologize for that. I'm trying to resolve some of my stream issues, but, um, yeah. Do we have any questions? Maybe about where you can get the code, who I am, what my background is in natural language processing. I see no questions. Well, I'll give it another minute or two um, and then I will say goodbye because it's been lovely uh, walking through all of these uh, examples with you but I realize you're probably all fed up to the back teeth of sitting down and watching things happen on the internet and maybe you just want to jump in and do the um, work through the code notebooks yourself and, and you'll have questions later. You can of course um, tweet uh, your questions or suggestions of um, other kinds of processes that you would like to see uh, you can tweet those at me, J Kazmaier Complex. Um, I'll put that in here. Um, yeah, so. It's all very quiet. All right, well, it looks like we have reached the end of our metaphorical rope. And uh, if no one has a, next, has a question in the next sort of 30 seconds or so, I will end this stream and say goodbye to you and remind you that next week we do the sentiment analysis code notebook and you can of course uh, actually jump ahead 
and do that if you want. The, it's listed here as classifiers because sentiment analysis is a commonly used uh, approach to classifiers. Um, but if you don't want to get a jump on it, you can just join me next week, uh, four o'clock in the afternoon again. I'll be wearing a different coloured shirt. I have nothing else to say, so no questions have come in. So thank you very much, everybody, and I will see you next week. Bye.